So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for our Belfast Summer School Lecture. I'm really delighted to welcome our speaker today. I'm delighted to welcome all the speakers, but especially um, today, Professor James Robson, who is Professor of Classical Studies at the Open University. As you know, the Classical, um, the Open University has a, a special place in my heart. And I first met um, James in July 2005, very long time ago at the London Summer School, um, which I was attending as a student and James was my tutor. And I have such fond memories of the, the 10 days in, um, in London. And del we're delighted to have you here, James. Um, so James, he completed his undergraduate degree at Exeter and then uh, postgraduate degrees at King's College London and his PhD thesis is on humour and obscenity in the works of Aristophanes. And he's worked at the Open University since 2000 and has been involved in the production of modules on fifth century Greece and Latin and Greek language modules, which I'm sure some of you um, are familiar with. I certainly took those modules. And uh, James is also Honorary Secretary of the Classical Association in the UK. And we're really pleased to have you today talking to us about translation. Um, so I'll just hand over to you now, James. That's wonderful. Thanks, Helen. I just stepped down as OnSec actually, but I'm gonna be, uh, I'm now Grants Officer of the CA. I'm trying to share my screen. Can you now see my slide deck? Yeah, can you see me as well? Yes. You can. OK, so just so I know not to put any faces, that's that's really useful. I'm going to try and move my things around on my screen so I can read my notes at the same time. But um, thank you so much for having me and thank you for that um, introduction, Helen. That was a very special year. I can't believe you revealed the date um, when we had that um, that summer school in in London. It was a very special class, too. I've just seen a couple more names of people I know as well, which is absolutely um, fantastic to to see. Um, and yeah, I mean, I taught on the, the London Summer School and Classics for, for 16 years and I'm just such a huge believer in summer schools as a project. I mean, I went to a comprehensive myself with no exposure to Latin or Greek, and summer schools were a way that I could I'd skill up and sort of become a, become a real class assistant and put myself in line actually for, for getting a job. And as you say, I've now been at the Open University for 22 years, but without the summer schools and without the bursaries that organizations like Jack doesn't know what now is, sorry, Jack's as it was, uh, the CA isn't now, is uh, provides, um, that, that's something I wouldn't have been able to do either. and. I've been uh, particularly impressed really with all the extraordinary work that, that Helen and her colleagues have put in in Northern Ireland, as I, as I was saying whilst we were talking before. Um, it's been really uh, amazing to, to see what Helen's achieved over the years and just, just the determination, hard work that goes into it. And also the kind of place of love that that must come from as well, which is a wonderful part, of course, about being a classicist, because that's how so many of us feel about our subject. Um, yeah, so when I got the invitation, I did my normal thing of thinking, oh my goodness me, what am I going to talk about? Am I really the right person to do this? But the fact is, I've, I've written a, a number of articles on translation using translation studies. Um, I've also published translations myself as, as part of larger works or a translation of, a, of an ancient Greek historian, um, as I did a few years back. <clears throat> but I think more importantly than any of this, um, I've used translation studies in teaching uh, with the modules that I've helped to produce at the Open University. And uh, that's been a really important thing for me. Um, so what we've done is uh, in both Latin and Greek modules is get students to think about trans translation styles, different ways of translating, and also developing a skill that I call reading through translation. So an ability to experience a lot of what you experience about the classical world through translation, but to be able to think about what the text is lying beneath those. And so developing a sense of, of those texts, but also being able to use the skills of the trade. So dictionaries and facing page translations and commentaries and things like that, which we try and build in to language skills, language acquisition at quite a, an early stage. And so that uh, so that students are using their, their language to to help them understand the ancient world better all the time. So I hope to draw on these uh, perspectives and bring them into the discussion today. And so what I hope to cover in this talk is well to provide an introduction to the discipline of translation studies, a gentle one and a sense of why this is relevant and important to students of classics. I want to give you some basic tools and vocabulary for talking about translation. 
and also get you thinking about different translation styles, um, especially by comparing alternative translations of the same passages, which I think is one of the fun things that we get our, our students to do. So I hope you agree that it's that it's fun too. And a further thing I want to achieve today is perhaps to get you to think about and maybe challenge some of the assumptions that you probably have about translation and about translations, although the very nature of assumptions, of course, is that you might not be aware of them and might not have articulated them before now. And this has been a really the important part of working in this area for me, I, I see the world differently through a translation studies lens. I read translations in a different way, and I probably uh, respect them and their variety more as well. And on the way, we'll be looking at some passages of Euripides, Aristophanes, Thucydides, and Catullus. Um, so I'm mainly going to focus on Greek authors today because I'm a Hellenist rather than a Latinist. But just to be clear, I'm not going to be thrusting any passages of Greek in front of you, and I'm not assuming any previous knowledge of, of any language, let alone Greek. Um, and I should also say that the kind of things I'm going to, be say, going to be saying today could equally apply to translations of Latin texts. So these are all transferable concepts. So I'm going to start off today with some big and perhaps unanswerable questions which relate to a lot of what I'm going to say. So Obviously, translation is important and necessary for us to be able to understand things that are said and written in languages that we don't speak. So obviously, translation, um, uh, sorry, uh, and, and similarly, uh, translation allows us to, allows what we say and uh, what we write to be understood by others that don't speak our language too, of course. So my big and unanswerable questions are these, if I can leave my slides on. Oh, I have trouble doing that. One second. Hmm. Bear with me. Ah, there we go. So, yeah, so my questions are, are these. So what makes a good translation? And is the translation always inferior to the original text? Now, I'm not expecting any, any wonderful answers. I'm just going to give you 30 seconds to, to ponder those two very big questions, which I'm sure you could write a, an essay or thesis about, and then come back to some initial responses from me. So yeah, th 30 seconds is ticking away. I have a very contented dog here who's been lulled to sleep by the sound of my speaking. So I hope the same hasn't happened to you. Um, okay, so as I said, these questions will underpin a lot of what I'm going to say later, but just to go through some things that, um, that you might have said or thought in relation to these questions. So in, in terms of what makes a good translation, I'm gonna guess that you've thought of a concept like accuracy, although maybe that's difficult to define. You may have, to draw on my title, you may have had something to say along the lines of a good translation conveys the letter and or the spirit of the original text or utterance. Um, you might have said that, well, it, it really depends on what you're translating, who the translation is for, and what purpose it's envisaged as serving. And I'm going to come back to all of these things in a little while. And then the second question is a translation of a text always inferior to the original text. I often ask this question and sort of mock interview situations. And I tend to get the same answer, which is yes, people tend to think that a translation is necessarily inferior to the original text. But you may have said that, you may again have said it depends, or I don't know, or simply no. And again, your views of a given translation might well differ depending on what the translation is the translation of, what it's for, and who it's aimed at. So you might reasonably think, for example, that the translation of a set of instructions for a piece of flat pack furniture is nothing special, but equally you might think that the original instructions in the original language are nothing special either. So it, they're more comparable than one being inferior than the other. Um, this might be an example yeah, of a translation uh, just being functional. A lot of translations are. But thinking about the translations of literary texts for a moment, which is really where we're going to center the discussion today, it's also worth bearing in mind that some translations can become canonical or classics in their own right. 
The example I normally wheel out at this stage is the King James Bible. People don't tend to think of this as being a translation. It's just a, it's just a very important uh, book. And the words that it contain, we don't think about oh, what was the original Hebrew or Greek behind that often. Some people do, obviously. Um, and so this is, this is a book that a lot of people have grown up with and respect as canonical without really thinking of it as being a translation, let alone an inferior one. And I think there are probably other instances too. I was I was trying to cast my mind back. And so a children's book, for example, like the Moomins, I don't think you read it and think, oh, I wonder what the original Swedish says. You just take it, um, take it as read. It's something you've grown up with and you're used to. And so that has become a canonical version of the text for you, despite the fact it was um, originally written in, the, in another language. And I think there are some classics translations too, the translation of translations of classical texts, which are seen as being pretty canonical. I think maybe I'd go out on a limb here and say Richmond Lattimore's Iliad, a lot of people use it. I certainly use it at university. You kind of, you, you think of it as being pretty much the, the real thing, as close to Homer as you can get. It's in verse, it sounds grand, it sounds very Homeric. My first introduction to the Odyssey was by, uh, was through Evie Rue's Odyssey, which reads a lot in, in hindsight, like a kind of 1940s novel. It, similar to, it had the aspirations, I suppose, of the era in which it was translated. But I think if I hadn't become a professional classicist, I would think of the Odyssey as being essentially this, this quite cuddly 1940s novel rather than being the epic poem that it is. So it sort of depends what you're exposed to, what you're brought up with, what you're used to. So I'm going to take a step back from these uh, bigger questions for a moment and try and put my slides forward, which I'm having trouble with. Yeah, there we go. Oh, now I've gone too far. Right. Um, and so translation studies is essentially a, a field which has emerged as an academic discipline over the last 50 years or so. Although discussion of the issues surrounding translation can be traced back as far as Cicero and Horace. Typically, translation studies scholars are practicing translators themselves, characteristically working with modern languages, of course. And there's always been a really strong tradition in translation studies scholarship of marrying theory with practice, which is something I really like. So thinking about the practical problems and live issues of translation and how those can be approached and solved. And also how theory can both draw on and inform the practical task and challenges of translation. So when thinking about the translation of Greek and Latin, we're normally talking about literary texts, of course, so drama, poetry, history, philosophy, and so on. But I got there. But with people working with modern languages, then a, a far wider um, set of texts um, is likely to be the kind of thing that they're dealing with. So we could be translating, as I example I gave at the beginning, an instruction book that's on manual, a textbook, subtitles of a TV drama which has that have their own discipline. You're not allowed too many words on screen at the same time. A website text, legal documents, or simultaneous translation in the context of a of a meeting, for example. And there are plenty of other examples you can think of of things which need translating and are translated regularly. And so given this huge potential variety of text types, then it can be useful to think about the aim or purpose of a translation, or as it's sometimes called, to give it a fancy Greek name, the skopos. And this skopos will, this aim or purpose will differ hugely depending on whether the text to be translated as an instruction booklet, set of subtitles, literary work, and so on. And importantly too, to state the obvious, different translation strategies will be appropriate to different text types to appeal to different audiences and so on. To add some more translations studies uh, terminology into the mix then, you'll often find terms like source language and source text and target language and target text used. So in the case of the translation of Homer's Iliad for an Anglophone readership, then the source language is ancient Greek, and the source text is the original ancient Greek poem of Homer's, whereas the target language is English and the target text is the English translation itself, such as Richmond Lattimore's Iliad or indeed Evie Rue's Odyssey. And building on these terms, you might, you might describe a translation as being source, sex, sorry, source text orientated, that is when it aims to reflect the assumptions conventions and values of the society that produced it, i.e. ancient Greece or Rome, or alternatively, it might be described as 
target text orientated. So that is adapted to the norms and expectations of the receiving culture, i.e. the modern English speaking world. And I would argue that Evie Rue's Odyssey is, a, is an example of that. This, there is this kind of cozy novelistic post-war feel to it. Um, so it is a product of its time designed for a particular readership. The difference between these two approaches can be neatly demonstrated by two very different versions of the first few lines of Aristophanes' comedy Clouds. This is a comic play originally staged in Athens in 423 BCE, and the opening scene of the play involves a father, Strepsides, who's unable to sleep and is lamenting his problems. So these include the ongoing Peloponnesian War and its consequences, but also the behavior of his son who manages to sleep despite being responsible for running up the debts that are keeping Strepsides awake at night. So I've deliberately chosen two very different versions of the text to, to look at here. So the first is a translation of this passage by the Aristophanic scholar, Alan Summerstein. This is from a parallel text, so a facing page translation with the Greek on the left-hand side and the English on the right. And it was originally published in 1982. It's a scholarly edition of the play. It's an Aristotle Phillips edition of the play. So there are notes in the back as well. And so the, the readership, it's aimed at students. It's aimed at scholars as well who have access to the original Greek. And the second extract we'll look at is uh, from a version of the play from 2008, uh, which is a partly modernized musical adaptation of Clouds. But let's have a look at the Summerstein uh, passage first. So Strepsides in this monologue that starts the play says, oof, Lord Zeus, what a length of nighttime. It's unending. Is it, ever, is it never going to be day? Though I heard the cock crow a time ago, but the slaves are snoring. They wouldn't have been in the old days. Damn you, war. Damn you on a hundred counts when it's not even possible for me to punish my slaves. And this fine young man here, he doesn't wake up before daylight either. He's farting away, swathed in five fleeced cloaks. All right. If you want to, let's cover our heads and snore. No, I just can't sleep, heaven help me, with being bitten and nagged by expenses and mangers and debts on account of this son of mine. So I know I'm not going to get any acting offers anytime soon, but bear with me. Um, so I haven't given you the Greek, uh, as I said, to, to, to grapple with, but you can take my word for it that it's a pretty close translation. There's a pretty close correlation between the English and Greek. Every Greek word can be linked back to be um, to linked to a word in the English and, and vice versa. And you might notice as well, the line numbers on the, on the right-hand side. This is designed for somebody who wants to engage really closely uh, with the original text. Uh, the, so that this, this has a distinct audience and a distinct purpose as edition, but I would also say that it's written in, in fluent English with an attempt to capture some of the feel and literary qualities of the Greek. That's one of the things I actually like about Summerstein's translations. Um, and in terms of literary qualities, well, you can see words like bitten and nagged and mangers there at the bottom. It might have struck you as a bit odd, but these are all signposts to the fact that the thing that Strepsides' son is spending all his money on is, is horses, we go on to discover in the not too distant future. So this is, this is partly a crib, uh, but it's partly, I would suggest, a, a kind of commentary on the text to judge what Summerstein understands the Greek to signify and arguably with an attempt to reflect the tone of the Greek in English too. So that's one kind of translation, but let's contrast this with a very different version of the passage. Okay, I hope you can read that. It's, it's, it's long, so um, I've had to, had to squeeze it on one page. Now this was originally um, written for, to be delivered in a West Country accent, which I have been practicing today, but I'm not sure I can do it with a straight face. Um, so you'll have to imagine that. Um, so this was, a, this was a version of Clouds, which was which a stage which I saw in performance in two slightly different versions um, towards the end of the 2000s. And so this, this opening part was in fact sung by Strepsides in a relatively modern setting, although he was also dressed in a, in a smock, as you can see from the photograph there. So it goes with swearing included. So chimping, arsing, cramping, chimp, a uh, crapping chimp. Oh, bollocks and bugger and balls. I've been tossing all night through this endless night. And yes, I've had no sleep at all. I've tried all the tricks to help me relax, deep breathing and chamomile tea. Dan Brown's new book didn't send me to sleep. That usually works for me. It's all very well for this gentleman here, just farting away in his fleeces. He snores and he dreams and gets up after lunch while our lives are falling to pieces. 
a hundred times over, I damn the war. I can't even beat my own slaves anymore, even though they're still snoring at four. So you want to know what has brought on all this stress? Well, you don't, but I'm telling you anyway. It's the son of mine. He's got me in a fine mess of expenses and debts I can't pay. Okay, I'll do the, I'll do the, I'll do the West Country after a beer later. Um, so obviously this is a very different kind of version of this passage. And I think the word version is important here. This isn't a, a translation in the sense of a word for word or phrase for phrase translation. Instead, it's designed very much to be a performance text and, a, and designed for an audience at a particular time and in a particular cultural setting. So there are elements that might now seem to us outdated, such as the reference to the Da Vinci Code writer, Dan Brown, remember that? And interesting, this, this version seems to, be, seems to be much more dated than Summerstein's version of the text, despite the fact that this was written in 2008 and Summerstein's version was written at the beginning of the 1980s. So we have contemporary allusions here. We have rhyme and indeed song uh, where there was none in the original. And we have some details that are added, but um, others that are lost. But a really important point to make here is that this really worked on stage. The play was sharp, it was lively, it was funny in performance and, and topical too. And in a way that a close translation would simply not have been. And it was arguably a really great introduction to an advert for Greek comedy for a general audience. And for me, at least, it captured some of the sharpness, liveliness, funniness and topicality that no doubt Aristophanes original audience would have enjoyed with his clouds in 423 BC. Or put another way, it captured or translated something beyond the precise words of the source text. So I've deliberately chosen to do very contrasting passages and texts which have very different objectives. It's probably fair to, to call this last version, this Kalo Kagathoi version of the text, an adaptation or version of the opening lines of Clouds rather than a translation per se. Though I should stress that adaptation and version are, are loose terms that lack commonly agreed definitions. They do get bandied around a lot anyway, for obvious reasons. And while on the subject of, of loose terms, this is probably a good point to pick up on the words letter and spirit again, which I used in the title of this talk. For all the translation studies scholarship that the last 50 years has produced, these terms are still regularly drawn on in discussions of translations, especially you'll note in, in reviews, for example, academic reviews. And also you find concepts of fidelity and faithfulness and accuracy cropping up a lot in, in people's comments. So there are two really fantastic articulations of the importance of the letter on the one hand and the spirit on the other from two literary giants of the 20th century, which I'm gonna introduce you to now. And these are Vladimir Nabokov, Nabokov even, and um, Ezra Pound. So let's have a look at what um, Nabokov has to say first. So yeah, in the one corner, we have the Russian American novelist, Vladimir Nabokov. So he began writing in Russian then moved to the States and, and then wrote in English. And he's probably best known for his novel, Lolita. And writing in 1955, Nabokov championed a translation style for literary texts that exhibits extreme faithfulness to the letter of the source text. So he said, the person who desires to turn a literary masterpiece into another language has only one duty to perform, to reproduce with absolute exactitude the whole text and nothing but the text. And he goes on to say, a translation should take the form of a heavily footnoted word for word rendering of the text in question, accompanied by towers of explanatory footnotes. Well, so much for translating the letter, but what about the spirit? So in the other corner, we find the American born, much, but much traveled modernist poet, Ezra Pound, who was of the view that conveying the spirit of the text is the most important consideration. So he suggested that a translation should be conceived as a rewrite designed to convey the underlying energies of the original. And he famously advised the translator of one of his own works, in fact, don't bother about the words, translate the meaning, and those, those capitals are in the original. So again, this distinction partly, if nevertheless, Im nevertheless imperfectly, maps onto the notion of a translation being either source text orientated at one extreme or target text orientated 
at the other. And underlying these differences, um, these different approaches again, are issues of purpose, audience, and so on. So to take the discussion a bit further, uh, let's have another look, a look at another piece of Greek drama, this time a passage from Euripides' Medea, which was first performed in 431 BC, so just a few years before clouds um, in also in Athens. And the following translations are versions of lines 16 to 35 of the, of the play. They form part of the opening speech of the play during which the nurse to Medea's two children explains what has happened to her mistress. She outlines Medea's extraordinary history, her life story, and also how she's arrived in Corinth, the city where the play takes place. She also, describe, she also describes how Medea is eaten away currently by the betrayal of her husband and father of her children, Jason, who has left her for another woman, Glauke, the princess of the, the, the princess of Corinth, who is the daughter of, of King Creon. So again, a couple of translations to compare here. The first is James Morwood's 1997 translation, and this is from the Oxford World Classics series. Uh, again, it's a relatively close translation where each phrase and sentence can effectively be matched against an equivalent phrase and sentence in the Greek. And as befits the Oxford World Classic series, it's a translation of the play aimed at a general readership as well as students of the play. So let's see uh, what the nurse has to say in Morwood's version. But now hatred has corroded everything and dearest love grows sick. Jason has betrayed his own children and my mistress and beds down in a royal match. He has married the daughter of Creon, who rules this land. Unhappy Medea, thus dishonored, cries out his oaths, invokes that weightiest pledge of his right hand, and calls the gods to witness how he has repaid her. She lies there, eating nothing, surrendering her body to her sorrows, pining away in tears unceasingly, since she saw that her husband had wronged her. She will not look up, will not lift her face from the ground, but listens to her friends as they give advice no more than if she were a rock or wave of the sea, save that sometimes she turns away her pale, pale neck and bemoans to herself her dear father and her country and the home which she betrayed to come here with the man who now holds her in dishonor. Schooled by this misfortune, the poor woman has learnt what it is to be parted from one's fatherland. So yeah, this translation is quite close to the Greek. You're gonna to have to take my word for it again. And in aiming to convey the letter of the source text, includes some quite long sentences. She will not look, she will not look up, for example, that really does go on for some time. It also includes some fairly formal language as befits a translation of Greek tragedy, perhaps thus dishonored, no more than if she were, save that, and so on. And finally, it includes detail, which makes sense in the context of classical Greece, but less so to modern English speakers, e.g. oaths rather than, say, promises and pledge of his right hand, which, again, we sort of have to translate into another culture. It's not really part of our world. So let's now compare this with a different translation. So this is a 1994 translation of Medea by Raphael and MacLeish. Same passage. Now my lady is lost, loves rancid, sour. My lord turns traitor, look, betrays his children, plays Medea false. He beds a new princess, plots marriage. Glauke, daughter of Creon who rules this land. Medea's out, stripped of her place. The oaths he swore, the promises, gods witness the change in Jason's heart. She won't be comforted, refuses food rags, anguish, weeps the days away. Her husband, who else could do such wrong? She won't look up, she stares at the ground. Offer soothing words, she's as cold as stone, bitter as the sea. Like a ghost, she turns away, cries, father, father, weeps for home, the country she betrayed, for Jason, who rapes her pride. The tragic lesson learnt too late. She should have held on to what she had. So you can see that this is based on the same source text passage, but is also clearly very different. There are far fewer words with the expression arguably more immediate than the Morwood translation. The sentences are short, sometimes single words, sour, rags, 
anguish. There are riffs on the detail of the original too, such, such as Medea's cries of father, father, which are actualized in this version, whereas the Greek just talks of her bemoaning her father. There are some poetic flourishes too, such as bitter as the sea, introducing ideas that are at best implicit in the Greek and certainly not articulated explicitly by Euripides. But thinking back to the concept of skopos or purpose helps us to account for these differences, of course. This is clearly a translation designed to be performed in contrast to more words, which, which seems more designed to be read and studied. There's clearly material injected by the writers too, making this more of a version of the play than a straight translation. And to reintroduce some terminology from earlier, this text is more target text orientated and adapted to the sensibilities and expectations of mo a modern theater audience in its expression. Importantly, the short sentences provide, provide the potential actors with an opportunity to breathe and focus on conveying the emotions bound up in Medea's dilemma in language which a theatre audience would arguably find easier to assimilate. So to take this discussion forward a bit further, yeah, I want to introduce you to two terms which make a slightly different distinction from source text orientated and target text orientated. These are foreignization and domestication, terms coined by the influential translation studies scholar Lawrence Venuti, who you can see on the right there. So foreignization involves translating a text in such a way as to make readers aware that they're reading a text in translation, such as by including anachronisms or by reflecting the word order of the original text. Whereas domestication involves what Venuti calls reducing the foreign text to target language values so as to make it immediately recognizable and intelligible to a reader. In short, domestication means that the translated work is given the illusion of not really being a translation at all, but rather a work originally written in the target language. That's to say something domestic rather than foreign. In line with what I said earlier about translation studies marrying up theory and practice, these considerations which Venuti surfaces are not just academic problems, they represent live practical concerns for translators of ancient texts. This is particularly the case with an author like the one I work on, Aristophanes, whose plays contain lots of colloquialisms and references to culturally specific everyday objects. One translator who really interests me in this regard is Geoffrey Henderson, who in his bilingual Loeb translation of Aristophanes wasps, sorry, Aristophanes frogs even, uses words like minestrone, munchies, and lummox, with his translation of assemblywomen in the same edition, using words like psychopath and salsa. My guess is that these represent an attempt to make the dialogue lively and contemporary for a modern Anglophone reader in the same way that Aristophanes Greek would have struck a fifth century BCE audience as lively and contemporary. But where I struggle a little, I suppose, is where to put them on the domestication and foreignization spectrum. On the one hand, yes, these are concepts from the modern world, not that of classical Athens, so they could arguably be categorized as examples of domestication. But on the other, these far from bland modern terms and colloquialism seem striking and out of place in a translation of an ancient text, with the result that Henderson's readers would plausibly be, um, be um, more rather than less conscious uh, that what they were reading was a translation. And in this light, these terms are probably best classified as examples of foreignization. Either way, I think it's worth gauging our own personal reactions to Henderson's strategy and reflecting on any preconceptions we may have. Do we consider Henderson's translation strategy an acceptable and engaging attempt to render the colloquial Greek used by Aristophanes? Or do we find these kind of words in a translation of a classical text somehow unacceptable and unappealing? And I think it's worth bearing atten uh, drawing attention to the fact that this is part of a, a facing page translation again. So for those with the Greek, you can look across to the left and find out what these words are that he's rendered in this way, which I, th I do think makes a difference. A more straightforward, if quite subtle, example of foreignization can be found in the work of a translator of Herodotus called David Green, who also interests me. This is because he chooses to reflect in his English translation the syntax and repetition of Herodotus's original Greek in a way that many other translators choose not to. So let's have a look here at the story that Herodotus tells about Artemisia, the queen of Halicarnassus, and her actions 
at the Battle of Salamis in 480 BCE, where the Persian navy led by King Xerxes confronts the Greek fleet. I'll read you the first parts of the story as translated by Clawton in his 2008 translation of Herodotus's histories, and the second part in the 1987 translation by Green. And as you'll see, Clawton, if that's indeed how you pronounce his name, is a more standard, straight up and down domesticating translation, whereas Green makes a number of nods to Herodotus's distinctive prose style. So to begin, I can't tell you exactly how all of the other barbarians and Greeks fought, but I can say this story about Artemisia and her deeds that won her even more honor from the king. At the very moment when the king's forces had descended into chaos, Artemisia's ship was being pursued by an Athenian ship. There were allied ships ahead of her and she was at very close quarters with the enemy so that there was no way for her to escape. So this is what she decided to do and it worked out well for her. Since she was being pursued by the Athenian ship, she rammed an allied ship. The crew was from Kalinda and Damis, Damis I knew I was going to have to do this. Damasithumos, their king, was on board. I can't tell you whether there had been some argument between them while still at the Hellespont, or whether what she did was premeditated, or whether the Kalindian ship just happened by chance to be in the way. Anyway, she rammed it and sank it, and though sinking, she was lucky enough to get a double benefit. When the captain of the Athenian ship saw her ramming a barbarian ship, he assumed that Artemisia's ship was either Greek or a barbarian ship that was turning traitor and fighting on their side. So she turned away from the pursuit. So that I would argue is the more standard approach to Herodotus as Greek, but the story goes on in Green's version. Which I have to show you. Yeah. That is the way her stroke of luck befell her, that she escaped and did not meet destruction there. But there is the additional fact that Having done evil to Xerxes, as, as a result of that very evil, she won particular renown with him. For it is said that, as the king watched, he noticed the vessel doing the ramming, and some one of his courtiers standing by said, Master, do you see Artemisia, how well she fights? And lo, she has sunk a vessel of the enemy. He asked if the action was really that of Artemisia, and they said yes, for they could clearly read the ensign on her ship. The destroyed vessel, they concluded, was an enemy, as I said, everything happened to her good luck in this, and most of all, that the ship of the Kalindians that was destroyed had not a single man escape alive to accuse her. So Xerxes, they say, in answer to what they had told him, observed, my men have become women and my women men. That is what Xerxes said. So with the first passage, Herodotus's so-called paratactic or strong along style isn't really in evidence. The syntax is sort of smoothed out and the, the passage reads more or less like good English. But in the second passage by Green, the syntax I would say is looser and there's the kind of repetition, which is indeed used by Herodotus, which tends to be avoided in polished English prose. So we find having done evil as a result of that very evil. Do you see Artemisia, how well she fights? This is what they say Xerxes said. And there were also some sentences whose word order is a little unusual in the English, like that uh, escape that I tripped over a bit. So yes, Green is, uses a uh, foreignizing style, I think, which is at variance with most other translators of Herodotus, and which you are, of course, at liberty to like or hate if you wish. But one point to make here is that Green was entering a crowded market with his translation of Herodotus and might reasonably have been looking for a way uh, for his translation to stand out. And there's a general rule here, I'd say, that you tend to find more examples of experimental translation with authors whose works have been translated a lot. With another general rule being that drama and poetry often attracts more experimental work too, for obvious reasons, I guess, to do with conveying something beyond the letter of the text. On that note, and I'm nearing my conclusion, on that note, I couldn't resist showing you some quick examples of translations of Latin poetry based on one of the ancient world's most translated po poets in modern times, namely Catullus. So there you have your Latin, um, nice four, four line bit of um, elegiacs there. Below that you have a, a, a more rather than less literal translation. Then uh, on the top right, you have a translation which reflects a bit more the word order of the original. And then you have this, these extraordinary translations which were produced by this couple, the Zukovskis, in the 1960s, where the meaning is sort of there somewhere, but actually 
what they try to do is to recreate the sounds of the original poem with some of the meaning reflected in there too. Uh, those are really extraordinary reads, so do, do have a look at those and have, have fun with them, especially the, uh, Zukovsky's translation at the, at the bottom. Uh, worth a Google, there's some nice websites with examples of these, often with um, comparisons, um, which, is, which is where I've stolen this from, from obviously. So yeah, I'll give you, I'll give, whilst I have a sip of, uh, of drink, I'll let you have a quick look at those. My dog's got bored and gone away. So again, I hope, I hope that hasn't happened to you. So just to round this discussion of foreignization and domestication off, it's worth saying that Lawrence Venuti, who coined these terms, certainly favors foreignization as a translation strategy advocating that translators should lose what he calls their invisibility. And for him, this is a really important concept. This lack of visibility is strongly bound up with what he sees as the poor status of uh, that translations and translators uh, generally enjoy. You know, that the, there are people who get to do literary translations, but lots of other jobbing translators are on, you know, uh, um, temporary temporary contracts, gig, gig economy, and don't get paid or respected or even acknowledged a lot of the time for what they do. So yeah, he's written a very uh, political political book on that um, on that theme. And yeah, just one of the many ways in which translation can in fact be political. So to to sum up, yeah, that was a very short introduction to translation studies and some of the work that, that we do at the OU with our students, also reflecting some of the work that I do a bit as, a, as an academic too, um, looking at translation strategies, especially surrounding the translation of various elements of Aristophanes' work in particular plays. And so I hope I've opened a door onto the world of translation studies for you and given you some interesting things to think about. To state the obvious, I, I hope, I'm not suggesting that translations are somehow a, a substitute for learning a language like Latin or Greek, but I am keen to say that translations are not just a way to access um, texts in a language that you don't understand. They can provide new perspectives, food for thought, and access to the ways in which experts in the field understand or have understood a given work or passage historically. And they can also play the important role of breathing new life into ancient texts and providing new ways to approach, understand, and enjoy them. For me as well in my teaching, I found that thinking about the issues surrounding translation provides students with a clear way of connecting their study of Latin and Greek with their studies of the culture and history more broadly of the ancient world, and also allows students, even with quite rudimentary language skills, to understand the ancient world better, so by using parallel texts and examining keywords, for example, in Latin and Greek. Okay, but that's enough of a hard sell for me, so I will now stop there and take any questions you may have and try and work out how to stop showing my screen in a second. There we go. Oh yeah, and sorry, that, that are my details at the end, should you wish to, to um, get in touch with me afterwards. That was fabulous, James. Thank you so much. Um, would you mind if, um, if anyone wanted your, your slides, I could send them? Would that be okay, or would you rather not? That's absolutely fine. Um, the one thing I will say that I know that I've just ripped images and um, texts off the web, so um, I haven't you know, cleared any of these for copyright. So this is this is this is purely uh, one uh, one person sharing uh, for the for the purposes of academic endeavor uh, with with another. If but if people would like a copy of my slides, then yeah, by all means, uh, write to me. Okay, super. Well, thank you very much, James. That was really really brilliant. So interesting. Um, there are a couple of um, well, there's quite a few comments in the in the chat. And um, I see a question. Um, Reminder has mentioned what I was thinking of there with the Catullus, how um, some translators um, translated, they, they um, well, Reminder calls them delicate um, verses of Latin, uh, verses that they were, uh, what did she say actually? I was thinking of Catullus that it, some of it wasn't translated, or am I thinking of, um, Daphnis and Chloe, some of that was oh. just left in Latin and, you know, because it was. Ab absolutely. So I'm, I'm, as, I'm of a sufficient age that I can remember using some of those loves that uh, at university myself. I seem to remember yeah, yeah, most of us, uh, wait a minute, I think it was a Latin text and some, and uh, it had been tr 
the translation was in Italian, but somebody had a more up-to-date version. So we're all crowding around their lab to see what that what, that, what that actually says. But of course, it, it served the, the purpose of drawing attention to those passages so that you, that you knew you wanted to read them all the more. Yeah, so this, this is, this is a, a really interesting tr in, in tradition. So I've, I've just completed a book on Aristophanes Lysistrata, and I've been looking at the reception history of that play. And it's so fascinating. So it's kind of barely touched in the Victorian era. The first translation into English of that play, which was a translation of all of Aristophanes' plays, so it's one of the last to be translated into, into English, just had a third of the text just completely missing, which the translator refused to translate. Um, and then when the next Victorian translator came along, Benjamin Bickley Rogers, whose translation ended up um, uh, underpinning the Lerb series that was published, I think, in the 1920s uh, initially, he just left passages out too. And so when, when they were published, they had, to ha they had to be reinserted and so it had to be translated anonymously. But you have to work quite hard reading some of those early translations to, to, to find the references. And it's only when you sort of look across the Greek, you, you kind of work out that the, the, the dirty word that they've, they, they've translated in a certain way. I mean, then, then of course, kind of all bets were off after a while. And so in the 1960s in particular, um, authors like Aristophanes and Catullus were really rediscovered, partly because people kind of were able to, to, to start working on them uh, shamelessly, um, finally. Um, but then if you sort of, if you carry that story forward as well, um, after, after you know, a huge explosion of interest, what you, what you find in more recent translations of, of Lysistra, which I was looking at the the, the rude word, the original uh, rude word about what the sex drive is about um, that's used at the beginning of the play. And after 2000, a lot of translators, again, avoid putting it in, um, in, in plain English, as it were, and especially American translators as well. So it's, in, it's interesting how, you know, when I, when I was a student, you sort of felt you were, you were moving towards this um, world where, where prudishness was disappearing, but that's not actually true. And of course, cultural vectors shift all, all the time so yeah that's my that's my comment on that point <laughs> thank you um okay so there's a question from martin uh martin says given that the reader may come to the translation without knowledge of the original is there a professional or ethical requirement of the translator to acknowledge the extent of divergence or adaptation yeah, I think this is a really interesting point as well. I mean, so, sometimes the point that's made, I was sort of getting at towards the end of the talk as well, that if you're doing the first or one of the few translations of a text into English, then there's more, it's more sort of beholden on you to do something which is close, because that is the way that readers are going to have access to the original text. And perhaps there's room for more experimentation with a with an author like Catullus or, or Aristophanes or, or whoever. Uh, Homer has, has had loads of translations, like, loads of translators. It's the most translated uh, classical text of the 20th century. And so being a bit more experimental in the knowledge that, that readers can find um, a closer translation somewhere else is, as you say, it's sort of fine. Um, what is interesting about the way that translation studies scholars, how, how a lot of translation studies scholars approach these things is they get quite excited about the fact that translators are kind of adding value to translation. So in one of my pieces, I, I, I cite um, uh, the example of Susan Basnett, who is kind of the, the doy, doyen of translation studies in, in the UK. And she gets very ex excited about a, um, a, a translation into English of a, of a Petrarch um, um, sonnet and talking about all the different all the different things that this translator has brought to it that aren't in the original Italian and, and it's a, in one sense it, it is an exciting translation in the New English translation by Thomas Wyatt um, because it's a it's a real fusion and it says things about the culture in which it's being translated into as well as the original Petrarchan verse but as you say what it doesn't serve very well as an English reader who wants to know what Petrarch said and was getting at. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that, that there's room for all of these all of these things, but I think it's also good to be clear about what you're doing. And one thing which, um, if I'm passionate about anything, it's that translators actually make a statement at the beginning of the editions. You see that more often than you used to, translators stepping forward and saying things. And I think that's one thing that translation studies has hoped has helped to encourage but sometimes still people say very disappointingly little about their translation style and what they're doing and, and what their readers who don't have access to the, the other language are actually accessing through reading their work. Okay, thank you. Um, Leila, hi Leila. Leila says, well it's not this isn't strictly related but she's heard that 
translation is the, the worst way to learn a language and immersion is the only good way to learn a language. She thinks, is, does this have yeah. any, this claim of any basis in truth? Yeah, I mean, that's that's about language learning pedagogy. It's something I also I happen to dabble with in a, in, a, in, a, in a different part of my life as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you look at um, modern exam papers from modern languages nowadays, translation is not favoured at all. Um, but neither translation into the language nor translation out of the language. Certainly that was how I was taught French at A level and, and German too, to, to a certain extent was by translating lumps of, of uh, French and German into, into English and getting told of who my English was bad and, and vice versa. Uh, but this, yeah, the, um, there is a school of thought that as you say, it's about, it's, it's about immersion, it's about encouraging people to think actively in that language rather than thinking between languages. And it's true that it's a different kind of thing, a different kind of skill, I, I, I suppose. I think I'm gonna say more than that. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you. Um, and Tricia remarks that it's interesting to read the introductions to many Bible translations to see what they've done. And she compares the message with the King James Version. Um, that was that was interesting what you mentioned about that. Are there any other questions from anyone? Does anyone want to shout out? OK. Well, I think, oh, Megan says, which do you prefer? I don't know what that's a reference to, it's no. difficult to say. <laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm spotting more names I know as well. I'm very excited. Thank you. Thank you so much for the attendance today. I thought it was going to be Yumi and a dog. So um, <laughs> it's, really, it's really lovely to know that so many people are interested in, in this topic and um, are more interested in me than grabbing an ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so delighted that everyone has joined us today. Thank you so much, James, for joining us. It was it was brilliant. It was fascinating. It really, really enjoyed your talk. And um, oh, Megan says, which do you prefer to the types of translation? Domest, domest, I can't even say it. Domestic, um, uh, yeah, domestication or foreignization. foreignization. Yeah, I'm, I, it, it's like children. I don't think we're allowed to have a favourite. <laughs> um Kerry did you have your hands up no you didn't Simon oh you're th oh you're applauding okay all right okay, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that thanks all right okay super look thanks very much indeed um for everyone joining us today and um we have another talk tomorrow the last one tomorrow from Professor Roy Gibson about Latin how much Latin is there but Join me in thanking James for that wonderful talk, for taking time out of his day to join us. We really appreciate it. And we love the OU. And um, yeah. thank you for, for everything you've done, James. Super. You're too kind. Well, you, you too, Helen. Thanks, thanks so much again for the invite. And uh, thanks for being such a, such a great crowd as well. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. OK, super. Thank you. Look, thanks a million, James. Um, I will be in touch. Okay, I'm warned. <laughs> All right, bye then. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.